Very pleasant, good Sunday morning, everyone. I'm Dan Swadley, and happy July the 4th weekend. I hope you and your family are being safe, and uh, just uh, say a word of prayer of thanks for our freedoms that we share in our country. I attend the Bass Chapel Baptist Church, and Bass Chapel is located on Highway 125 between Fairgrove and Stratford, Missouri, and you will have no trouble finding us there as uh, you go between the two cities. And if you get ready, you'll be able to join us this morning. We will open the doors at 1015. Services actually start at 1020, and you would be uh, welcome to join us. Should you need prayer or have questions about anything that you hear on this morning's Sunday School lesson, you can write us at BassChapelSBC, gmail.com. The church office number there and Pastor Russell's cell phone number is there also. I would encourage you to tune in here at Facebook Live for uh, all of the activities that we have. Our Sunday school is uh, every Sunday morning at 9.30. Our worship services are at 10.20. We do meet in the gym, but then we air those services on Facebook at 6 p.m. Right now, Pastor Russell is uh, uh, going through a, a series called Fearless. It has been such a blessing to myself and my wife, especially as we go through these fearful times that we are in. And uh, the Lord blesses Brother Russell. He brings us uh, the Word of God. His messages are anointed and are from the Lord. And I would encourage you uh, either to uh, be there in person or to hear the messages at uh, 6 tonight. And then on our Wednesday evening services, once again, we're still uh, doing Facebook Live. And uh, our current series is The Coronavirus and Christ uh, uh, from a booklet by John Piper. It, too, has been a blessing to uh, me and uh, my personal walk with the Lord. And uh, I think we have one more uh, lesson uh, left on it, either one or two. And so uh, you can hear that on Wednesdays here at Facebook Live. And that's at 7 p.m. If you missed any of these, the uh, Sunday school, the worship service, or the uh, Wednesday evening service, uh, those are all archived on Facebook. And so you can go to Facebook and click on Bass Chapel's page and then click on the videos and you can see all of those videos uh, that uh, we have uh, brought to you. Uh, if you would like to give to the church, we have a couple of ways to give. If you would like to send your offering, there is the uh, address, P.O. Box 493, Stratford, Missouri. If you'd like to do an online giving, there uh, is the web address there, and I have some directions there if you need help. Uh, once again, this morning at 1020, uh, worship and preaching with Kevin Morris, uh, worship uh, by Brother Kevin, and then uh, preaching by Pastor Russell. That will be at 1020 in the gym. So we're starting a new unit today, and I believe we have five lessons in this unit. The title of the unit is Jesus the Teacher. Most of you know that uh, I was a teacher and retired from teaching. I taught for a little over 20 years. My wife taught for 30-some-odd. Uh, and so how to teach and the ability of the teacher and the learner has always been something interesting to me personally. And I can tell you that Jesus was a master teacher. And so we're going to look at these five lessons uh, Jesus teaches about discipleship this morning. And then next week, Jesus teaches about the cost of discipleship. Yes, it does cost to be his disciple. And then uh, on July 19th, should Jesus tarry, we're going to be teaching uh, Jesus teaches about prayer, followed by Jesus teaching about treasure. And then uh, on August the 2nd, Jesus teaches about the good shepherd. 
Our session in a sentence is in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus taught what it means to live as one of his disciples. And we'll be taking all of our scripture from Matthew 5, 6, and 7 in this morning's lesson. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, that we have our own copy of it, that we can read it and love it and learn and live by it. Lord, I pray that as we study your word this morning, that you will allow the Holy Spirit to just uh, open the book up and that that same Holy Spirit that inspired writers of old to uh, write it down, that you would uh, illuminate it in our lives and let the Holy Spirit just teach us what you would have for us to teach. Lord, we know that it is such a privilege that we can be your disciple, and we pray, dear Lord, that we would be good disciples. In Jesus' name, amen. So we see here first that disciples are to be salt and light. This is taken from Matthew 13 through 16. And it says in verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the, that are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So we see here that the first thing is the Bible tells us as Christians that we are to be salt. Now, I have a, a, a heart disease called heart failure, and when I was first diagnosed as, uh, as uh, uh, that, as having that, one of the first things that the doctor said was I needed to restrict or uh, almost eliminate the salt in my diet because, uh, of course, it uh, makes your blood pressure go up. Well, I tried some salt substitutes, and let me just tell you, I've come to the conclusion after trying many of them, <laughs> there is no substitute for salt. Uh, they can call it salt. It can look like salt, but there is no substitute for it. And so here, the Bible tells us that we as Christians are to be the salt of the earth. And as I look at this, I see that salt is a preservative. I think the Lord is telling us here that we as Christians are in the process of preserving the things of the Bible, the things of the Lord to a lost world. We're the only organization that would do that. Uh, the atheists are going to do everything they can to, to do away with the things of the Bible, to do away with the things of the Lord. The lost don't care about that. So we, as being the salt in the earth, we preserve those things. And then salt changes its environment. Our worldly environment needs to be different. We are here because we are to be the salt of the earth. You add salt to something and it will enhance the flavor. Sometimes it speeds uh, healing. It, it does different things. Uh, I have a water softener, and we put salt pellets into it. When I do that, it changes the environment of the water that I drink and that we have. Uh, salt changes its environment that it's added to, and I believe that we as Christians are called to change our environment. We need to be different. We, uh, we need to show the world our difference. We are here to show what the salt of the earth is. Matthew 5, 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Now, you and I rub shoulders with folks every day who they're hungry and they're thirsty for things, and they don't know what it is that they're hungry and they are thirsty for. But if you and I can be the salt of the earth, then we can show them that they are thirsty. You know, uh, you have cattle out here, or uh, sometimes uh, we put uh, salt lakes out for uh, deer. And, and the reason they do that is because that 
makes them thirsty. They drink more. Well, that's what we need to do to a lost and dying world is they need to see the salt in our life, and then that will cause them to be thirsty for the things of the Lord. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And then we have the privilege of showing them not the temporary water, but as Jesus told the woman at the well in John 4, 14, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And we have the privilege of being that salt of the earth. And then the word tells us that we need to be the light. Well, what happens when we shine a light on something? Uh, We live out here in the woods and there's no street lights and it's uh, very dark out here. So it doesn't take much light at all. And I can get a much clearer view whenever I use a light. And that's what we are to show the world as we are the lights of the world. They get a view of his mercies, of his salvation, of his grace, of his faithfulness. We have the honor of being able to give the world a clear view of what the light of Jesus is because that light lives in us. And then another thing that uh, light does is it exposes darkness. John 12, 46 says, I have come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. People don't like, especially if they're ashamed of what they're doing, they don't like when the light is applied to their lives. And we uh, have the privilege of exposing darkness to a world. Now, the world's not going to understand it. They're not going to get that it's dark. But they will, their darkness will be exposed. We certainly, in our current culture, we live uh, when darkness has become light and light has become dark. We, We live where right has become wrong and wrong has become right. But darkness is still dark. And it's the light of the world, that light that shines in us, that exposes that darkness. And then the light is the strength of life. We talked uh, last week uh, quite a bit about uh, uh, light and that the very first thing that the the God of creation that he created was light. And it had to be that way because basically if we don't have light, then uh, nothing's going to happen. Plants are not going to grow and then animals can't eat, et cetera, et cetera. And that's the same thing with our life is that his light is the strength of our life. Psalm 27, 1 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? We are called to be salt and light. And so not only did Jesus' disciples, not only were they called to be salt and light, But Jesus' disciples are to obey God's glory, not their own. And so we see here in Matthew 6, 1, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who's in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward. But but when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. And as I look at this uh, particular uh, passage of Scripture, and in fact, uh, most all of this chapter, uh, there on the left-hand side of the screen, you will see that um, there's there's this uh, dilemma between two things. You can have your reward now, a temporary reward, and you can receive that reward of men, or you can have your reward later, and it will be an eternal reward. 
We see here that uh, in practicing righteousness, in giving to the needy, in praying, and we find that in verse 5, and fasting, which is in verse 16, all of these things, uh, the, the, the emphasis is on if you want to do them now, there will be your reward. Not just to do them, but if you want to let everybody know, hey, I, I am practicing righteousness today. I'm, I am being right with God or giving to the needy or praying or fasting. <clears throat> we see that, um, uh, the Father who sees in secret will reward you. And I don't know about you, but I'd sure prefer to have God's rewarding that he, when he rewards us, than man's approval. And so it's up to us whether we want to reward now or whether we want to do those things in secret, knowing that God sees us. And then this passage talks about hypocrites. And so that the definition of a hypocrite is the practice, practice of claiming to have moral standards or belief to which one's own behavior does not conform or having a pretense. Revelation 3.1, and to the angel of the church in Sardis write the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive but you are dead. And so this is a great definition <clears throat> of what a hypocrite is, that uh, they everybody thought, man, these people are extremely religious. They love Jesus. They do all of the right things. But inside, Revelation says, they were dead. Uh, Matthew 7 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. That's why it is so important for us as Christians to make sure that our walk, I heard uh, my former pastor, Brother Mitch, he always his, he had a saying that said, our walkie-walkie needs to match our talkie-talkie. And that's exactly right. Our, our walk, what, the way we walk needs to match what we're saying. Because if it doesn't, then we are a hypocrite. And so uh, the Lord does not want us to do that. He wants us to obey for his glory and uh, not our own. So we see Jesus' disciples are to be salt and light. Jesus' disciples are to obey for God's glory, not their own. And then Jesus' disciples are to live purposefully. Again, Matthew seven nineteen. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter to the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of the Father in heaven. Our, we see here that Jesus' disciples are supposed to live with a purpose. And our, our lesson brings out, after giving his listeners a blueprint for Christian living, Jesus issued an important warning. Outward compliance to Jesus' command is not enough to place someone in the kingdom of God. You can look really good by the things you say and do, but just as it is possible to do good works as a show before human beings, it is possible to do good works as a show before God himself, and he rejects all such shows. Matthew seven fifteen. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inward, inwardly are ravenous wolves. So we, as Christians as God's people, we need to make sure that we're not sheeps in wolf's clothing, that what we uh, are portraying is what the, the Lord would want us to do. And then we need to watch out for false prophets. We need to make sure that those people that we listen to and that we revere and those people are preaching the true word of God. I I have three examples here 
of worrying about the outward, of being overly concerned with the outward. And so the first one will be in Genesis 3, and it says, it's the story, of course, of Adam and Eve, and it says, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was the delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, She took of the fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Notice that the only, I mean, they had just disobeyed God. They had 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 been the one in our next few verses here say, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking into the garden in the cool of the day, and the man, the wife, hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? Now, God didn't say that because he didn't know where they were. He knew where that they were. He wanted them to confess what they had done and and what they're worried about rather than the fact that they had committed sin, rather than the fact that they had disobeyed God. They had disobeyed the God that they walked with in the cool of the evening. What did they do? They made themselves loincloths because they were concerned with the outward appearance. And then another example is David. And actually, I love this story. Samuel did in 1 Samuel uh, 16:4. It says, Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him, trembling, and said, Do you come peaceably? And he said, Peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourself and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. And then in verse 6, when they came, he looked at... Eli and said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. And now I love this verse as we're talking about people being overly concerned with the outward. Notice what the verse says, for the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And I am so thankful that that's the kind of Lord that we serve, is that he knows my heart. He knows what I'm feeling. He knows what I'm going through. And so I don't have to worry about an outward demonstration of the way that uh, I act to try to fool people, because Uh, I serve my Lord, and he sees my heart. And then the scribes and the Pharisees in Matthew 23 says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Now, this was, uh, you know, Jesus was calling it like it was. He was, uh, he didn't beat around the bush. And it says, For you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So we see here that Jesus exposed them to what was on the inside. They they had it all right when it was on the outside, but Jesus exposed what was on the inside. And that's the purpose of this uh, particular point in the lesson, is that we need to make sure our insides are right and focus on the inward rather than the outward. How do we do that? Well, I have some suggestions here. You might want to write these down, come back to this later. Your list might be uh, different, but um, here, here are some suggestions to make sure that the inward man is changed and we focus on the inward rather than the outward. First of all, make sure the in, in, inner man has been renewed. You have to be saved. You can't change yourself from within. You can't just say, well, I'm going to make a, a New Year's resolution or pull myself up by the bootstraps or whatever uh, unless you have had an experience with Jesus Christ, you will never be able to change your inner man. And he is the only one to save us. He is the uh, one that when we ask him, he'll come into our heart. And he is the one that can change the inner man, can renew the inner man. Now, 
in order to not focus on the outward and in, in order to focus on the inward, you have to feed the inner man. You know, I like to eat three or four times a day at a minimum, uh, uh, but I, my soul needs feeding that many times too. How do you do that? Well, uh, you read God's word for one thing. Um, that will help you to be able to feed the inner man. Read God's word, love it, and learn it, and live it. And then pray without ceasing, the Bible tells us. I mean, be in a constant prayer. You should never say amen in your prayer life. I mean, it always should be just uh, uh, going, you know, from uh, this prayer uh, to that prayer. And we are to pray without ceasing. Grow in the Lord. Uh, I know people who have been a Christian for many years, and I'm not the judge. I couldn't say, you know, there's a... There's not a meter on them that would say, but just by the fruit, just by their actions, they are the same as right after they were first saved. And I believe that one of the ways that we can can, uh, focus on the inward man is to grow in the Lord. Uh, The word tells us if we'll draw near to him, that he will draw near to us. I think another way to be able to focus on the inward is to make the things of God a high priority. I mean a high priority, not just a priority, but a, a high priority. Oh, uh, I guess I'll get ready and go to church this morning. Oh, I guess I'll have my personal devotions today or whatever. It should be a top priority to make the things of God and to be obedient to what God asks us to do as a high priority. Uh, I think one of the ways that we can focus on the inward man is is give to his work. And, and of course, I'm talking about uh, giving a minimum of a tithe. That's a, a 10% of what you earn. Uh, but that's just a starting place. But you can also give uh, in your time and give in your talents, too. And then share with others about him. Be be Jesus to those who you are around. That's a great way to focus on the inward rather than the outward. You let them see Jesus in you. Uh, I've heard the saying, and you have too, I'm sure you're the only Bible that some people know. And then get involved in serving. Uh, We should not live our lives just to ourselves. Get involved in serving. Teach a class. Volunteer. Do what you can. We can't all preach. We can't all lead the singing. We can't all teach a Sunday school class. And and I don't know what God's called you to do, but I can tell you he has called you to do something. Um, when I, uh, when Julie and I attended First Baptist Brookline, uh, we had a lady that uh, her ministry was sending cards. And uh, any time that she heard that anybody was sick in the church, you could just mark it down the next day. You were going to get a card from her uh, telling you that she was praying for you and that she loved you and that she cared. And uh, I've known people who uh, would call, people who would send cards, people who would show concern. There's a, a thousand and one different ways to be involved in serving. And if you'll pray and ask the Holy Spirit, he will show you what he has for you to do. And then I, I think this is a, a, a given. I think this is important. I know this has uh, been important in my life. Fill your life with the things of God. Uh, Christian radio, music, sermons, um, there are, we live in a time in history that is just so wonderful that I can listen to some of the best sermons any time that I want. I can listen to good radio, good music uh, all the time. And uh, with the advent of the internet, I mean, it's just limitless what we can do. I, I, uh, I know there are people that uh, prefer to uh, listen to songs about somebody's wife running around on them or or a tear in my beer songs or something like that. But, folks, I'd, I'd rather listen to music about how much the Lord loves me and how much that he cares for me and of a home in heaven and, and all of those type of things. I made this little slide because I wanted you to know that 
uh, here in Springfield anyway, we have uh, uh, four different options of listening to a good Christian radio. Uh, 99.5 is a, a little harder contemporary Christian music. Uh, the Wind plays contemporary and praise and worship music. Uh, KWFC uh, plays Southern Gospel and Country Gospel music. Bot Radio has no music at all. Uh, all of their um, whole entire program is uh, preaching and teaching and Christian talk. And so uh, those are great options to keep your, your radio, on, radio on to help you to grow, to keep the things of God in front of you. When I was pastoring, I can't tell you how many times that I had the radio on and a particular song came on and it got me to thinking. And before long, I built a sermon around that. And then there's also many, many different options uh, on the Internet that will uh, bless you. Here are a couple of, uh, three of them that uh, Julie and I listen to. K-Love, that is a uh, contemporary, uh, I would say, I would call it contemporary praise and worship. Uh, then there's Moody Radio, and there's the address you see. They have many different uh, digital stations that uh, are all great. Uh, praise and worship is what we listen to a lot. And uh, then if we uh, are working or something and we just need some background music, we listen to Abiding Radio. It's all instrumental is the one we listen to. And uh, no advertisements, no words at all, no announcements, uh, anything like that. It's all just uh, instrumental music uh, on a Christian nature. And it keeps our mind on the things of the Lord. So we see Jesus' disciples are to be salt and light. Jesus' disciples are to obey for God's glory, not their own. And then Jesus' disciples are to live purposefully. Lord, we thank you for this time this morning that we have been able just to share in your word. I thank you, dear Lord, for each person who uh, is listening and has uh, enjoyed this. Lord, I pray for all of us that you would help us to become more like Jesus. And Lord, that we would be able to live by these things that we've been taught this morning and that uh, we could live a life that others could see Jesus in us. Go with us and guide us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.